Well, thank you. Such a large crowd joining us here. Two cool civil servants on stage. I know we're here at a startup event, but I wanted to start on an optimistic note and say Anne is one of the coolest public servants that I've ever come across, and I spent a lot of my career before journalism being a public servant too. So if the startup world uh, doesn't work out in the end, then please bring your entrepreneurship to government. Um, now let's dive right in, Anne. Um, I think we're both digital optimists, but there's a lot of evidence out there at the moment as well um, that technology is not just disrupting how our democratic conversations take place, but there are some real potentially negative um, effects out there. What's your take on that situation? Thank you so much. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I am a digital optimist. I've spent much of my career being uh, advocating a, a digitalization. But I have to say, since I became a civil servant in December 2014, my perspective has changed somewhat because I now see also um, a somewhat darker side of the internet emerging. And I actually think it's very appropriate uh, to have this conversation today uh, on the very day when the Americans uh, go to the, to the polls. Uh, so let's just uh, think for a moment about this phenomenon, Donald Trump. I am personally convinced that was it not for social media, he probably would not have been the candidate for the Republicans. And in preparing for this session, I came across a quote by Donald Trump that I want to share. So he says, uh, he says, I have this thing called Twitter and Facebook. It's like owning the New York Times without the losses. And let's think a little bit about this, what he's trying to say. Because in the world before social media, you had just the regular media, so TV and uh, newspapers. And what was the role of the media was to mediate. They would choose what was really newsworthy for us to read or to consume. But we no longer have that, and I think that has profound ramifications. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if we're in a post-fact society now. And as a journalist, it's something that I have to think through every single day, where am I spreading a rumor, or am I censoring you or myself if I don't share you this important development necessarily? Like it's always a fine line to balance, but I think that um, my impression is that it's not just a Donald Trump or an American issue. It's too easy for Europeans yeah. to dismiss it as an American problem. Um, if you look at the Brexit situation in the UK, for example, Nigel Farage probably wouldn't have got where he did without YouTube, certainly, and that's the analogy with Trump and Twitter. But by the same token, he used a lot of traditional media as well. Tabloids in the case of the UK, uh, cable news in the case of Donald Trump. Um, so maybe the question becomes, or tell us if you agree with this, um, that tech communities need to find new ways to take responsibility for these new dynamics that they're creating. So not somehow uh, being sued for every bad thing that goes on a platform, but um, this idea that potentially if you are creating billions in profit out of new platforms, out of new ways of engaging different communities, um, that maybe you need to spend more time figuring out how to, to monitor the really bad stuff that goes on in those communities. Well, I think, I mean, so before we talk uh, about social media again, just to go back to the regular mass media, and I think they need to ask themselves some questions too, because uh, digitalization has, of course, disrupted media as well. And what it means is that a populist will help drive business for media which then in turn gives them an incentive to give visibility to the populace. So i give you an example. When CNN hosted uh, the Republican debate, it was the highest viewership they have ever had. Why is that? Of course, because Donald Trump was there. The other example is the New York Times recently reported that Donald Trump got about the equivalent of two billion dollars worth of free uh, press coverage mm -hmm. just because of the outrageousness of what he says. 
So this is not just, as I said, about social media. This is also about the regular mainstream media. Yep. And there, I think it, it really warrants a very thorough reflection about what this means. Because let's go back for a moment. In the past, when you wanted to respond to something that appeared in the media, how would you do it? Ordinarily, you would write a letter to the editor. And what would you have to do? You would have to A, identify yourself. You would have to give your name. Mm -hmm. And you would have to write a response to something that you read. If you were completely outrageous in your response, chances are that you would have been edited or they would have to toned down your rhetoric. Now, we no longer have this. You know, you can just pretty much say anything you want on the internet. Yep, that, that tallies with my personal experience and possibly some of you in the audience where the people who hate the most uh, or create the most difficulty for me on Twitter and other platforms are certainly eggs or not necessarily bots, but they're people who don't have real identities, who won't be willing to put their name and their reputation on the line when it comes to trying to tear down some of the work that I'm involved in there. I guess one of the other questions, well, actually, no, one more point to make there is that it is a little bit um, about basic incentives as well. It's not just the technology. If you have an incentive system where you are paid more as an anchor of a TV network just because of higher ratings, then that calls into question your professional responsibilities and your ethical duties as a journalist as well. And that's quite separate from the technology. That's about what we as a profession do to organize ourselves. Um, the other question that really jumps into my mind about the spread of social and how it's driving so much of the conversation in the US and other elections now is the question of how much of it is just noise. I think what we'll see today probably is that Hillary Clinton's ground game, good old fashioned, driving people to the polls, knocking on doors, conversations at dinner tables, um, probably is likely to <laughs> outsmart some of the online driven organizing that Trump has been best at. Um, do you see that in your work and that you've got to continue engaging in old ways of communicating and thinking? And how much do you just go into these new technological developments? Absolutely. I was mentioning in a session earlier today that I'm actually linked on Facebook with someone who is a very enthusiastic supporter of Donald Trump. And on many occasions, I thought, I'm just, I, I want to unfriend this person because it's so awful what, what she is posting. But I thought, I shouldn't do that because it is part of my responsibility of living in a democracy to try to understand what others think. Because this is the essence of democracy. It's about dialogue. It's about finding compromise. So it's too easy to just dismiss all of this. We need to pay attention because obviously a lot of people are very disgruntled and are very angry with the establishment. So we, sh we must not close our eyes from this, but we must also not be naive. Because democracy is about openness, but if that openness is abused to essentially destroy the system, then that's really a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. And do you have any examples that you see inside the EU or in your own direct work at the moment where technology is really a critical factor in building something up rather than tearing it down? Because it's too easy to just assume we're all going to be atomized by this digital revolution. There are also ways that we can be brought together. Absolutely. It's not in the immediate uh, realm of what we are talking about, but the EU has been at the forefront of working with internet companies on um, radicalization. You know that a lot of youngsters, they radicalize on the internet, and the EU has uh, created a for it's called the e European Internet Forum, and has proactively worked with companies, um, internet companies, to, uh, to, to deal with this issue. And now, for instance, um, when someone searches for ISIS, it is very likely that they're not just going to find ISIS propaganda videos, but also a counter narrative. So I'm not proposing this necessarily for news, but I'm saying we're, we're starting to realize that something potentially very detrimental is happening here. And I think that the internet firms have a very big incentive to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the other, like, let's join these two themes of is technology going to kill democracy? Um, but let's look at how technology can democratize the work of a civil servant or an institution that a lot of people find hard to understand, like the EU. Um, how, how are you using technology to factor um, more perspectives, more ideas, better thinking into how the EU does its job? 
Well, I think, I mean, we have never worked in such transparent ways. Uh, so much of the work that I do goes right up on the internet for everyone to see. I think that is important. But we must also understand that the EU itself is very complex. It's not always easy to explain in uh, 140 characters or so, you know. And there I'm really counting on uh, citizens to inform themselves and to try to understand better what is going on here. My concern is a little bit that it's a, we have a new generation that has never really lived through major turbulence. I remember when I was a child growing up in a divided Germany. So I grew up in West Germany. And as a child, I was afraid of the Soviet Union. I was afraid that they might come into Germany and my mom is Swedish and we always said as a family that if this would happen if Germany was occupied by this uh, West Germany was occupied by the Soviet Union we would move to Sweden because Sweden was a um, was a, is, is and is a neutral country but my point is growing up in a divided country I cherish democracy I know that it's nothing that we can take for granted, and I'm very worried that there is a new generation that maybe thinks only about all the rights, but not also of the responsibilities that we have in democracies, which is that we have to be informed to a certain degree. We have to be responsible, because democracy in and of itself, I think we are seeing, can be quite fragile. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful note to wrap up on, to remember that there was a history before the internet, and that part of that history teaches us that democracy is very fragile. So whether we're using all of the new tools at our disposal or we're simply trying to hold our communities together by remembering that there is a difference in those communities and there's worth discussions talking about those differences, um, then we'll be in a, a better position as a society. So thank you, Anne Mettler, for joining us. And thank good you. luck with the rest of the Web Summit. Thank you.